You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Joshua Smith. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Author Stories. I'm Hank Garner, your host. You can find all of the archives at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please subscribe to the show. It'll make sure you never miss an episode. We've been bringing you a series of very special shows this week. An Athon Books Showcase, where uh, we partnered with Athon Books, one of the very best publishers in science fiction and fantasy. And we've been featuring some of their authors all week long and trying to show you some of the great work that's coming out of Athon right now by hearing from some of their authors and featuring some audiobook clips from some of their new books. Today's interview is with Joshua Smith. We have a great conversation about his brand new series that's just about to launch from Athon Books. Before we get into the interview with him, we have a special audiobook clip from Web of Eyes, the first book in the Buried Goddess Saga by Jamie Castle and Rhett Bruno. Stay tuned. After the audiobook clip, we'll jump right into the interview with Josh. Yarrington, the capital of the Glass Kingdom, practically sparkled like the waves on the torrential sea. Whitney could only guess that's how the kingdom's name was derived. It was a city that had stood the test of time, whose winding spindly streets appeared in constant motion as people from all over Pantigo went about their daily business. It was a city whose architecture proved the melding of these people, buildings with tall arches designed to allow giants' passage, small homes bore into boulders for dwarves, but mostly those more appealing to humans. The towering white walls surrounding it had helped it survive innumerable wars and sieges over the ages at least until King Liam had established himself and conquered those threatening the peace. Mount Lister could be seen standing tall and proud from anywhere in the city, anywhere except the spot where Whitney found himself. From there, he could only see the gray, damp walls of a cell, somewhere in the castle dungeons. He wondered why dungeon cells always had to be so dark. Motes of dust floated about, dancing in a thin ray of fading sunlight pouring in through a small, barred window, set so high he could only see a slice of the sky. He wiggled his fingers, creating shadows on the dirty floor. Ah, fresh meat, said a voice from the darkness. Whitney had been listening to the old man snore from the adjacent cell for what seemed like an hour. He'd wondered when he'd wake up. Hello, stranger, Whitney said, applying his best impression of nobility. A bit overdressed for a place like this, don't you say? The man stepped out of the darkness, his bony limbs creaking, shaking and wobbling with each step. He wore a filthy, tattered gray tunic like he'd just been draped with a sack. The few teeth he had left were yellow and thick with grime. Prince Brainerd of Gilligal, Whitney said with a flourish. That was his go-to identity in times like these. Gilligal was the name of some forgotten stronghold at the base of the dragon's tail, the mountains in the north where the dwarves dug their hollows. Whitney stumbled upon the ruins while running from an angry Brecklian lord after he'd spent a night with the man's favorite concubine. It was manned by a group of monks who worshipped a god they called the Lord of Eternal Silence. It was no wonder no one had heard of it. The crazy bastards had all taken a vow of silence. Never heard of no Gilligale, the man said. Oh, it's a beautiful land. Tall mountains, lush valleys, you know, the sort. A good lie was the very essence of thievery, and a lie was most easily told and believed when it was sprinkled with bits of truth. Whitney thought lying to be an art, not a skill, taking great pride in crafting his tall tales. He ain't a prince, a guard shouted, voice distant and removed. A series of laughs followed. Whitney counted four distinct voices. He moved closer to the bars, separating him from the geezer. They're right. He whispered, looking around as if trying to keep a secret. The old man's cackle turned into a wheeze, followed by a moist hacking. 
He almost fell over before finally recovering. What's your name, old man? Whitney asked, casually leaning against the prison bars. In response, the man simply lowered himself to the hard stone floor. Whitney cringed when the man stretched his wiry legs, his aging bones popping. Old people were the worst. They smelled, their bodies half decayed already. They were difficult to communicate with, always having trouble hearing. Since you're likely too old to hear me, allow me to be the first. My real name is Whitney Firestone. Perhaps you know the name? It didn't matter if a withering old prisoner knew the truth. He needed the man to trust him if he planned on getting out. The man cackled more. I've been in this cell longer than you've been alive, boy. Every day passes, I wonder why they ain't hanged me yet. No, I never heard of ye. He probably wasn't exaggerating. He was ancient. Probably knew the buried goddess before she got buried. How about a different question, then? Whitney turned his back and took a few steps away before returning his gaze to the man. What's an old man like you done to deserve the cell? The man eyed Whitney, his face beginning to soften, if only for a moment. His eyes scrunched and his mouth curled into a snarl. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Joshua Smith, my new friend, on the show with me. He's got a fantastic epic fantasy series that is just about to launch, and you yes. can go pre-order it right now. It's called the Immor- It's called Immortals, an epic fantasy adventure, uh, the essencers of Al- Alethea. Alethea. Thank you, thank you. I fantasy know, names, right? fantasy names. Alethea, book one in that new upcoming series from Athon Books. Uh, Joshua, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Hank. I'm really excited to be here, dude. I'm excited to have you. Um, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? (laughs) So uh, in fourth grade, um, well, actually, let's I'm going to predate this by saying in third grade, I didn't think I could write. I uh, actually I I didn't know how to use my imagination and put it on paper. So I had a teacher, uh, Mrs. Winston, who uh, I remember this. She was like, write a story about animals living in the zoo. And I'm thinking, what the you know, uh, I realized (laughs) I don't know if I can cuss. So I'm like, I'm going to hold off on that. So, you know, and so, uh, you know, but I did it. She helped me do it. And then in fourth grade, I was reading R.L. Stein's, uh, you know, Goosebumps. And I I was like, wow, let me write like one of those classic, you know, you hear them all the time now about authors writing their friends into these um, uh, early books. And so I wrote one of my own little Goosebumps about um, a uh I don't even remember what it was about, but yeah, a bunch of my friends were in it and then they all had me over. And so I did a little bit of a reading over at one guy's house. There was like five different friends. We were all sitting in the backyard doing this in a circle. So yeah, that was the start of my writing career. (laughs) I I love when, when someone has a specific memory that they can put their finger right on. I, I love that. I had a guest not too long ago speaking about writing your friends into your stories um, mm-hmm. She said that she had two sisters and she was constantly fighting with them. And her <laughs> dad told her, well, write a story about it. And and she wrote a story where she murdered both of her <gasps> sisters. Oh and, her, and her dad paid her for He thought it was hilarious. And he paid <laughs> her to do it and she and she kept writing these stories and he would just he would just die laughing and he would keep paying her to do that. And and now she writes murder mysteries, so yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> I love that story so enough. much. It's 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 a little terrifying to be honest. I mean, I I love that she did that, but I also love that I live in a different state. Right? Yeah. 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 It's like okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice to know you. Right. Bye. <laughs> right. Always be kind to strangers. You just never you never know. <laughs> yeah, they may be mur- murder mystery writer. <laughs> <laughs> so. So after that experience, did did that kind of unlock the whole creativity thing? I I, I love the idea that that you didn't know how to use yeah. your imagination. Can can you talk about like that discovery? Like what what was that like to to have that door opened? Wow, um, you know it took a lot of time. Uh, you know, uh, but then I started getting into science fiction. One of the first adult novels I ever read was Jurassic Park, nice. and I read it in like fifth grade. I know, pretty crazy, but I did it, 
and um, I didn't understand all the science. I didn't get it all, but I loved it. You know, uh, I, I've read it like three or four times afterwards. I, it's one of the few books that I've read multiple times. Um, and then I really got into science fiction, and it wasn't until high school that I really discovered fantasy. Um, I was in a creative writing class, and another teacher, Mrs. Hill, um, she was sitting while we were all working in the computer lab, and she was reading um, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, and I was like, what is this book? You know, I was like, what is this mysterious treasure you're reading? You know, like, <laughs> and, 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 uh, she tried to explain it to me and I was like, fantasy, what's fantasy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm used to like space and aliens and aliens chasing Ripley and like, you know, and, and so, you know, I asked the most intelligent question I could possibly think of at the time, which was, does anybody die? <laughs> and she, <laughs> and she gave me this look, and she smiled in this like little like knowing way, and she said, "Yes, there are some deaths." And so, spoiler alert: there are people who die in Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> Dang it! But I know, right? Uh, so, um, and uh, and that is when I started writing what would become today, uh, Alethea or Immortals. So. I actually wrote it first as a short story of um, uh, a character who hasn't even shown up yet um, in, uh, because I'm writing a six-book saga. Hopefully, hopefully it gets renewed to a six-book saga. I would love for, the, for us to go beyond the three books. Um, you know, uh, and, and so I wrote it from his perspective, and then I wrote a second one following um, uh, uh, main characters introduced in book two and book three. Um, but also, actually, no, the goblin. The goblin from Immortals. Oh my gosh, she was in it. He was the third main character. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, Miriam Eck is uh, still around and kicking. So, and, you know, causing chaos for everybody else. At, starting at, in book one. Starting in book one. So, when you started envisioning that series, did... Uh, you know, I, I love the beginnings of ideas, like, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times they're very different from, you know, the, the finished product. <laughs> oh. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I love the idea of like how ideas begin and, you know, and you, you talk about like, where do you get your ideas from? And it's such a lame question because ideas are everywhere. Right. Um, but there's, there's just something about the idea, the one that kind of floats to the top above all the yes. others and, and, and become something has the potential to become something like yes. when, when this first started hatching in your mind, yes. like what were, what were some of the, the original ideas that, that started taking shape? Well, it began with, um, so obviously, uh, I had, uh, this character who doesn't show up for a while. Um, you know, uh, and technically he's, he only cameos, uh, in the third book. Um, uh, but he was the main character and he was completely different. Um, and he was on a quest to save people. And, uh, and then the next one, which starred, uh, Yeltsin, who you get to meet in book two and Ian in book three and Miriam Eck, the goblin in immortals. Okay. Um, and, uh, and the battle that occurs in book three was actually the setting for this original story. And uh, and it was so dark and so depressing and so based off of World of Warcraft, I could cringe now. And, um, you know, I'm like, wow, you know, how brilliant was it to use the horde? I mean, <laughs> so, you know, I'm so glad I changed that. And, uh, you know, um, so... That that was it, but it really didn't start until – because I, I just shelved it. I shelved it. I wanted – I had other things to do. I had other things that I wanted to try, and um, and then uh, I was at this um, event, and they had – I can't remember who it was. If it was – I think it was law enforcement and somebody else, and they were talking about sex trafficking. Believe it or not, here we go, deep people. And um, and they were talking about um, uh, how pervasive of an issue it was and that there were organizations like um, this, this one that I like to promote called the Exodus Road. And these guys are like spec ops, former spec op guys go on undercover. You know, they gather intel 
Um, and they work with local law enforcement and bring down pimps and, you know, rescue um, um, the women and others in slavery and then get them to a safe place. And it's really incredible. So I was like, wow, how awesome would it be to turn this into a fantasy where I have elite knights, a.k.a. the, tw- uh, the 21st uh, Kingsman Company in book t- Book two, you actually get to meet one in book in Immortals. His name's Rorik, and um, and uh, and these guys. This is their mission: is to shut down the Slaver Coalition, which is one of the main big bads for the first three books. I love that idea so much. Um, I I love that fantasy can speak volumes to uh, to the real world and to situations that we're going through right now. Yes. In in a strangely entertaining way, and yeah. you, you know that that you come away from it feeling like you know something more about the real world uh, mm. after being having been immersed in this other thing. Uh, as as yeah. a as an original sci fi fan, uh, who then you know morphed over into fantasy, mm. do, do you feel like uh, the two are connected? I, I always think of sci fi and fantasy mm. as close cousins, if not half brothers or, or something like that. Um, oh, absolutely. You know, the, those lines get pretty blurred sometimes. And uh, I, I asked the, the question in a Facebook group uh, the other day uh, you know, about sci- uh, fantasy with a sci-fi, you know, tilt or something. And, man, people just hey. went nuts and all of the, the stuff. Um, how, how do you feel about that? And do you feel like <laughs> uh, the, the world of, of Aletheia has science fiction leanings? Uh, would that be a spoiler if I answered that question? Well, I don't know. I'll leave that to you. It's, it's, oh, it's to you. I don't know. Um, Steve's not here, but I really want to be like, Steve! <laughs> so, um, anyway. Uh, Only go where you're comfortable going. I, okay. I, I won't prod you. Um, hmm. Let's just say the world of Aletheia has been around. And... Um, uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we learn pretty quickly in the early chapters of Immortals that uh, God, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't answer your other question. Okay, well, I'll get back to it. It's okay. um, uh, uh, t- short answer on the sci-fi. Yes, absolutely. I think they are, you know, brothers or sisters or however you want to describe it. I absolutely think they are brothers and sisters in arms. Absolutely. I think there's so much that can cross over. You know, you give me Battlestar Galactica with a little bit of Game of Thrones and I am mm. so good or vice versa. Right. You know, um, uh, throw in some Lord of the Rings and I'm just like, hey, I love you forever. And, you, you know, uh, so it's, it, it, you know, um, I, I think that these – these genres have so much potential to speak to the heart of who we are. Um, you know, I love coming of age books. Now I couldn't do it with Aletheia like I wanted to initially, right. but, uh, you know, I think of Jim Butcher's Codex Alera or Robin Hobbs, you know, um, Forseer. I, yes, 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 yes. Okay. I love that series. Okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, I, I mean, they just they have so much to say, and they're so good. So, th- yes, brothers, uh, uh, brothers or sisters, whatever. Yes, indeed. Now, in regards to um, immortals, uh, we learn pretty early on that uh, this world has been around. That um, I have a dark lady, not a dark lord. I wanted a dark lady um, because everybody's got a dark lord. So screw that trope. Let's get a dark lady in, um, and. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and so the sorceress has destroyed the world before and she's gearing up to do it again. And, uh, we don't really know what she did exactly. Like there's some people who do know, and they're not exactly talking and it's enough to make the characters who have a little bit of information scared. And, um, and, uh, and so the world has been around. It's been around for over over 4,000 years, but nobody really knows what was 4,000 years ago. And so uh, that's the big discovery, and it continues throughout the entire uh, saga. Let, let's stick a pin in, uh, in Immortals for just a minute uh, oh. because for <laughs> – uh, for, for several years, you, yeah. your life took a sidetrack. 
Uh-huh. And uh, you you dealt with some health issues. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that's that's something that a lot of listeners can relate to, mm-hmm. uh, either in, with ourselves or family members. Um, yes. And a lot of times personal adversity like that uh, can be a creativity killer. Um, yes. And until you learn how to channel through that and it actually becomes uh, something that feeds creativity or can or can. Right. I'm not, not saying that it always has to be that way, but, you know, we're speaking in generalizations. Um, mm-hmm. First, uh, share what you're comfortable with. But uh, wh- what, what did you what did you deal with and how do you feel like that affected uh, bad or good or bad and good um, uh-huh. your creative process? And does Immortals and, and the series you're working on, does mm-hmm. <clears throat> has that experience fed that? <laughs> well, yes. And that's 18 ask. questions, I know. <laughs> I know, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll get to each one, <laughs> and, well, hopefully, if I can remember them all. Um, I, uh, I was a language arts teacher um, and uh, teaching fourth grade. And uh, in the middle of the year, my daughter was um, less than two months old. And um, I had... Somehow I got mono and um, possibly a second virus. They crossed over into the brain and caused uh, Parkinson's syndrome, syndrome, not disease. It's want to be very specific because there are people who deal with the disease and it is terrible. And syndrome, I I am blessed in a terrible sense that I can have this level of recovery with the syndrome. Um, you know, so it's two different things. Um, and then epilepsy. And so I went through over 10 seizures a day. Um, I spent about a year and a half, um, bedridden or in a chair, um, for the most part, um, or, or a wheelchair, um, living in three different rooms. And I have a, a family member who is blind and, um, I, I always – this is one of the best moments of my life was when he came up to me – well, <laughs> to visit – literally up because I was living in you know, the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Tower of Terror. Um, that's what I called it, um, second floor of, our, of the house. And, uh, and, and he came up and, and he said, Joshua, everybody's going to judge you by your disability. Um, so what are you going to do about it? And – that really helped kind of snap me out of the funk and the depression that I was in, wow. um, you know? And so I, I, you know, first off, um, like the only part of my body that I can move all the time was my right arm. And so there were times I would fall, I would hit my head on the bookshelf. I would be sitting or laying there for hours on end, you know, um, or half an hour or something until somebody came <laughs> and, hoisted me back up you know and so i was like but what if i fall what if i and he's like then you crawl soldier and so uh so that's what i started doing i i started to crawl and i started to come up with i need to do something with my life and i need to i need it to be meaningful and i needed to have purpose and oh my god i have this fantasy series that i was working on that i stopped that i shelved and You know, sure, it's been eight years since I interviewed anybody, you know, for uh, involved in combating sex trafficking or some of these other issues that that um, are revealed in this. So I decided that I was going to write Aletheia. Um, I initially self-published Immortals and Coalition under uh, different titles and with vastly – well, not vastly. They're – uh, there's new to, uh, there's new content in both of them, and that's kind of exciting for me. Um, and for readers, they're like, "Whoa, this is different, but awesome!" And same, and I love it. I'm like, I know, I I told you. But anyway, <laughs> um, so, sorry, that sounds so conceited. Um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, and and honestly, I I, I have to thank Stephen Rett for that. Um, but uh, you know. Um, because they let me take it further than I had dreamed. Um, and they were really patient during the editorial process. Um, and, um, they've been patient ever since. Uh, sometimes (laughs) I feel like I'm a writing diva almost. And like, like Steve, Steve got the, we were just working on the map. Oh, spoiler alert. Sorry. Um, and, (laughs) 
and and he he got the uh, uh, original files from the artist because we had a spelling issue, and he knew that there was going to be a problem because inevitably, you know, I have something that I'm going to fix, and so <laughs> or change because I'm never happy, and and so uh, you know, so they've just been awesome. Um, so that's what I did. I I I wrote those books, um, self published. Um, I had a, another person I really want to thank um, is Nicholas Sansbury Smith. And if you haven't read Nick's not, not, uh, Extinction Cycle series, oh yeah, yes, sci fi post apocalyptic. Um, just you know, I like the hashtag not zombies monsters. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, I I love it. I love it. I love. Uh, how he and Anthony Melchiori, um, two guys who who really helped uh, mentor me, um, Bill Massa too, who does urban fantasy. Um, but uh, those three guys, they really kind of helped me. And it was Nick who found Athon Books for me, and uh, uh, introduced me to Steve and Rhett. And um, and when I could walk, because I had to learn to walk again. And so I went from wheelchair to a walker to cane to, you know, now being seizure free since February, um, which is an incredible accomplishment and exciting and amazing. Um, you know, uh, but that, I mean, all before this, we, we traveled up to go see Nick. Um, and I had this moment where I'm like, because uh, I had reached out to him, I emailed him and I was like, thank you for writing a wounded warrior um, into your series. Um, uh, it, it just meant so much to me because, um, let's face it, wounded warriors are incredible. And if you're looking for inspiration, um, where are you going to go? But these guys who have sacrificed so much for us and, you know, come back and their lives are f forever changed and they keep fighting and I, I they're inspirational. And so, um, and so uh, we went up to Iowa, and um, and uh, Nick and I are sitting in this coffee shop. First off, I'm like fanboying all over the place because I'm like, <laughs> oh my god, I'm sitting next to Nicholas Sansbury Smith. And then I had to bring myself down to the point to realize, my god, this is just another human being. He's awesome. He's going to be an incredible friend. And I, I need to like see him not on a pedestal, but as an ally and as um, uh, uh, a, a, a friend who's going to walk with me through this. And I, you know, I was working on a scene as he uh, was writing next to me, and all of a sudden, I just felt like somebody was watching over my shoulder, and I just kind of like looked, turned a little bit to look, and Nick is watching me write. And he's reading what I'm writing, and he's like, your dialogue is amazing. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Nicholas Sandway Smith is reading over my shoulder. Calm, breathe, keep writing. Oh, that's <laughs> so, so funny. Yeah. It's, so <laughs> so you, you, you reignited your passion for writing. And, um, and, you know, if nothing else, it gives you an outlet to not just sit and, and feel sorry for yourself, which, you know, in, in, in a lot of cases – you know, it's, it's completely warranted. You know, some of us deserve to feel a little sorry for ourselves, at least for a minute, you know. Yes. Uh, but, yes, that's but important. Then, but then you got to shake it off and, yes. and and put some positive energy to Fight. what's going on. Fight. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So so you're you're uh, well now. Um, your your health is, is better. Yeah. And actually, I just got a um, a. a a uh, call for my neurologist today and they were like, Hey, you can work ha part time. And I'm like, what? And so, uh, um, so if you don't want me to have a nine to five listeners, please go buy my books. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, uh, but otherwise it's, it's an crazy an accomplishment, um, that, uh, we've gotten this far and there's so much to it. There's way more to that story. Um, and uh, how it works, um, you know, uh, it's not just, you know, your dedication and your heart has to be there. You have to have something to hope for. You, I mean, there's, there's way more to it. You got to have the medical care. You got to, you know, there's a, and, um, you know, there's, uh, his name's Shondo and he was on ABC's The Quest and you, you'll hear me talk about that probably some other times, but I love The Quest and he, uh, 
uh, hashtagged one um, percent better every day and hashtag attack the day. And that is, um, you know, uh, that that is something to me that really resonated was that my one percent better every day had to look completely different than everybody else's. Um, and that has to continue. Um, so I still have Parkinson issues. I still have those weird ticks but i haven't had a seizure since february and that's amazing congratulations that is something we're celebrating thank for you for sure yeah. yeah so let's let's pull the pin and Woo. uh go back to alathea um yes. what what well first off that uh what you said about uh nicholas sansbury smith um hmm. at, at looking over your shoulder and seeing your dialogue oh my um, god what makes great dialogue oh i want it to be human you know, like you and I talking right here. This is good dialogue. We're real. We're not faking it. We're, you know, um, we're, we're, we're just speaking in terms that we would with anybody else. And, you know, there is no script here. There is no, um, it is, it is just life. And, uh, yeah, there's going to be moments where, where, we we might have to sound a little different if we're giving a speech in front of, you know, say the entire tribe of the Wohazit who are survivors surviving and, you know, we're sending some of the only people who can help us out, you know, and, and so we give it a nice speech in that type of cultural language, you know, um, or uh, if you're um, this other character that I introduced um, uh, in this new draft, um, um, who I absolutely adore. Um, and, uh, and I based her off of the actress who plays in the expanse, who plays Abba Sarala. And, uh, and so if they ever make a movie or TV show of this, she totally has the part that's just going to be in the contract. And so, um, but you know, I, I, you know, I, I wanted to have this level of human, I wanted to get to know each character as best as I could. You know, I can't do it with every character, go really deep. But, you know, um, go as deep as possible with each one. Out their culture um, um, and figure out uh, how their culture speaks um, and then figure out how they kind of interact together. And um, and that's a big deal. Um, you know, when I was writing the pronunciation guide for the narrator, who is going to solve a lot of these problems for pronunciation? Because you're going to hear me say one thing and you're going to hear uh, this amazing um, narrator speak something else. Um, and, um, and, and I think you should go with what he says. Um, so um, so uh, I mis mispronounced the Greek word in front of a lot of people yesterday. So, you know, I'm kind of like, hey, we're OK. <laughs> so... Um, and, uh, you know, um, and, and anyway, so, um, I just, I just wanted that humanity and there's so many levels and so many layers to that. And, and you just have to keep, be willing to pull it back and spend time to pull it back. I, I think that's the main thing that people get wrong with dialogue or just completely miss is that these are supposed to be characters that mm -hmm. we as the readers fall in love with and yes. we care about. And if if they don't look and feel and sound real, um, then all of that is 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 you know a moot point. That's yes, you know, you, you have to anchor them in humanity in some way. Yes, I, I and if I can really quick, like um, at uh in the early chapters after the prologue were uh in a Aztec Mayan setting, um and um. And so they speak dramatically different than we do. And that was really hard to write. And I think for some readers, it's it, it's kind of like, oh, this is different. This is difficult. This is not the way that I would say something. And I'm like, I know. That's because that, that we wouldn't speak like them. And that's the whole point is that we are in a different setting. And, we, and, and uh, what happens when – one of the main characters, Abana, gets to interact with these people who are from a setting we're more familiar with. Um, and how does her entire dialogue change over the course of the saga, which is fun. 
fun to deal with. You know, um, she sometimes slips back and forth, and it's great. It's great. The speaking of um, uh, Mayan Aztec settings, yeah. uh, most fantasy. Uh, I, th- I would I would think the vast majority of fantasy reads like we are dropped into a medieval setting uh, uh-huh. or earlier, and uh-huh. it's vaguely reminiscent of <gasps> something that appears European. And you know that's that that is a that is a trope that is uh, yeah. You know, it, it's and it's kind of the default setting for I think for a lot of fantasy writers. It's just right. it just for some reason. It just feels right because yes. probably because it's been so overdone. Yes. Um, and, you know, in recent history, we see lots of different kinds of fantasy settings. Um, and, you know, even Brandon Sanderson, who kind of has this, this blend of science fiction fantasy. And, and mm-hmm. you know, we've got these fantasy worlds that are, you know, kind mm-hmm. of science fiction. And, and that opens gates to do lots of yes. interesting things. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you introduce a jungle? Huh. into fantasy setting and and how do you feel about kind of pushing those boundaries and getting away from medieval europe and and you know can it truly be fantasy if it's not the way we think in our mind well absolutely i mean um first off how do i introduce it let's all be real so, the first time you meet abana um she's trying to commit suicide <laughs> by way of crocodile um so you know uh and it's because she is a priestess for the sorceress once again the dark lady here we go two tropes broken um and um and so uh, uh abana has just been forced to commit a human sacrifice and in the process she it's revealed that this is not just any person that she's been sacrificing but it's an immortal Oh, spoiler alert. Um, and that's OK. It's the first chapter. I mean, right after like right after the prologue, people, you'll be fine. OK, um, so um, and so, um, you know, uh, and and so uh, and he's got some things to say right before he dies. And I'm not going to tell you what those are because uh, she starts remembering them um, at, uh, early on in her story. Um, but. Uh, you know, for her, I just wanted to do something different because we have this overdone European setting and I think that people are craving something new, but when we're craving something new, we don't always understand what that is going to entail. We don't understand, understand the difficulty. We don't understand the cultural sensitivities and the context of writing this. You know, um, sometimes I ask myself if I successfully accomplished writing uh, Aztec Mayan settings, uh, the Asian setting, the Middle Eastern, Greek, Roman, uh, Italian setting, uh, the um, uh, the 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 African setting. Um, uh, you know, like I was like, did I do this justice? I ask myself all the time. And I'm like, I hope so, because, you know, it's hit shelves in uh, T minus 12 days. So, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or 13 days. So, um, so uh, you know, uh, so there is there is always this, I, I want to be respectful and I want to do it right. But I want to do something different because I want to push myself past my own boundaries. Um, maybe that has a lot to do with my story. Maybe that has a lot to do with the things that I've had to deal with. Uh, is is constantly trying to look past myself and see what I can do. Um, but I think it is also helpful for us to really experience these new worlds. Um, and in terms of uh, the the land of Avok, um, which is uh, where Abana. Um, lives um and is controlled by the sorceress um i I mean we have magic there uh we have uh dinosaurs there are dinosaurs i love it you know um uh there are um uh there are these gods um and goddesses um that um still exist and will exist throughout the saga um and uh some of them are located right there in abana's um front yard and um and so i mean the idea that 
these other cultures can't have fantasy is ridiculous when you start re- researching them um, and researching their religion, their 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 history, uh, the you know uh, uh, you know the way that they looked at the world and perceived it um, um, through um, their lens rather than our typical European lens, and um, and I, I just thought that just makes good damn fantasy. Oh, I cussed again. Sorry. Oh, you're and, fine. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, and yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when the book opens, Alethea is in um, uh, ha- has been through some things. The world here has uh, <laughs> ha- has a history and and a dark recent history. Yes. Um, is is there a uh, a main quest in this book that that you are uh, taking us through as readers. Uh, mm-hmm. do, do you? I guess what I'm asking, and you don't have to reveal the specifics, but is there a grand plan for the story? Do you see an overarching story that oh. is telling telling a bigger story than we're going to see here in book one? Uh, yeah, I um, absolutely. Uh, gosh, okay, so. Um, Hmm. Let's just say uh, this book is different than some of the others because uh, these these people can't just take on the sorceress, right? You know, uh, I mean, y- you could try. Good luck. Um, uh, you know, it's like a level one character in a game goes up to try to take on the end and. And, and uh, boss, yeah, that's not going to work out very well for you, um, unless you're Ray from Star Wars, right? Unless you're Ray from Star Wars, yes. And I, and I say it's because she knew how to use her staff, because uh, she shifted her, her fighting style to incorporate some staff movements, which I loved. Um, when, when, she, oh, I spoiled. We just spoiled it again, bro. <laughs> like, what are we doing? <laughs> all right, everybody, go back and see a Force Awakens right now. Which um, is burning it all to the ground. Yes, but, um, <laughs> that's what she does. Uh, the sorceress, um, she uh, she likes to do that. Um, and uh, actually, she's got this weird fascination with fire, but that's besides the point. Um, and um, fires and snakes and genetics. She she screws with genetics a lot. She likes it. Um, so, oh, there's your sci-fi connection. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> See, get me talking long enough, and um, but there. I also want to emphasize that there's a, there's the first three books, and then there are, are a goal of another three because I want this to be a six book epic, and um, so provided the so well, and I even think that that Stephen read. I think they want. Uh, uh, I, I hope I don't cross any lines here, guys, by saying this, um, speaking to them. But I think they really want me to finish this, you know, and um, because I think uh, they see that this is a really huge, huge epic. And um, there, I, I do know the ending. Um, I, I've got one of two ways it can go down. Um, and... Um, but yeah, no, I've outlined almost everything. Now the outline is fluid; it's changing. Um, uh, book four is constantly like, "Oh, do I want to go this direction with it? Do I want to go this direction with it?" I'm not quite sure, you know, because I could do both, or I could save one for book five. What am I going to do, you know? Um, but yeah, there is definitely there. There's definitely um, an overarching uh, agenda for the entire series, uh, in terms of where they're going, how they're going to get there. Um, you know, I start planting, um, the major, um, uh, MacGuffins or whatever, um, uh, for the overarching quest of the six books in book one, but to get from A to B to, to, uh, Defeating the Dark Lady is is not as simple as, um, say, one of my readers wants it to be. He's like, oh, just have them do this magic thing and show up. And I'm like, mm, bro, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great in theory. <laughs> well, the, the new book, Immortals, is uh, it's up for pre-order now for, for just another uh, couple of weeks when you're hearing this. And it'll be hitting... Uh, in the Kindle edition and audio book, there's going to have a fantastic audio as, yeah. uh, as Joshua alluded to, 
Uh, Josh, it's been so much fun uh, yeah. chatting. Uh, is there a place online where people, if, if they're just learning about you and want to you know, follow along for news coming up, can, uh, can find you online? Yeah, um, I'm going to be completely updating my newsletter, but you can find me on Facebook. Um, I think – let me just double check. I think it's Joshua – because um, the guys just had me – initially, I was going Joshua Patrick Smith, but the guys were like, no, go Joshua Smith. I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, so um, that might be the case. But yes, I am on Facebook. Uh, there's I've got a Facebook page. Um, and hold on. I'll, I'll drop a link to it in the show notes as well. Awesome. OK, sweet. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and um, I'm working on a website as well. It looks terrible, but uh, eventually <laughs> it'll be joshuapatricksmith.com. Excellent. When you launch that, we'll update the notes so people yes. can find you. Um, Joshua, c- uh, congratulations on, on what you've accomplished, and good Thank luck you. on the book launch. Uh, we're going to send everybody to see you and, uh, mm-hmm. and to grab their copy of Immortals. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Hank, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me. You're, you're amazing. I love talking with you.